All right, if I open my hands like this, I convey the area that separates two households in a normal Palestinian refugee camp. If I open my hands like this, I am in two households at the same time, trying to communicate to two women that are restricted from going out of their household in order for us to, to help them change the life, the life that they are in. If I open my hands like this, this area conveys around 35 Palestinian households, averaging between seven to 11 members. If I open my hands like this, this is the area where I place my chair in order for me to sit and to talk to the two women, not two women, let's say around four women by four women in each household to explain to them the importance of getting up, working, and helping change the stereotypes that they have been normally uh, stained by. However, just to put you in a certain uh, idea, women are not, in most of the houses, women are not allowed to exit the proximity of their households. They're not allowed to engage in any work that has to do with outside normal domestic work. At this standpoint, we came to a realization that, all right, we stand at all. How can a woman who is raising her children, who is trying to ask for a change, do that if she's restricted directly by barely, barely 50 meters squared inside her household? We have more than half a million Palestinian refugees residing in Lebanon, over 12 camps spread all around the countries. They're not on the outskirts of the country, they are inside heavily condensed capitals of Lebanon. Beirut is the capital, however, we have major capital in the south called Saida, a major capital in the north called Tripoli. The most dense refugee camp is called Ain al-Hilwi, the refugee camp that I work in. It has around 100,000 refugees inside. That number is increasing now with all the problems with, uh, with Syria. Those 500,000 refugees that we have in Lebanon definitely will call for the help of UNHCR, High Commission for Refugees, and UNRWA, Relief Work Agency for Palestinian Refugee Camps. UNHCR and UNRWA all work to help to create a certain route for Palestinians by, by trying to establish for them certain educational and certain employment opportunities. However, to take note, the Lebanese government does not allow any Palestinian refugee camp any citizenship right neither ownership right. So these refugees, they cannot have access to proper education because our public system is disastrous. They cannot have access to any employment because for some odd reason, the Lebanese government asks them for a work permit. To get a work permit, you need to be gaining around $1,300 per month. I am an educated university graduate and I barely make $1,500. What can we say about a refugee who does not even have a high school diploma? So at that point, we decided we have to intervene. What is the least level of intervention when it comes to understanding that those women cannot leave the proximity of their households, they do not have the intellectual means, however, they have the energy and they have the capacity. Nothing else than agriculture. Agriculture, we always turn back to agriculture, but not any form of agriculture. We are talking about urban agriculture. Urban agriculture that directly allows a woman to go up to her roof, to her rooftop, and start planting up there. But for, for people that are not well aware of how certain efficient mechanisms can be done for agriculture, we stepped in. My project in Ain Helwe, which is in, to promote urban agriculture in one of the highly condensed refugee camps, has five major goals. Number one, to promote the idea of urban agriculture and rooftop gardening. Number two is to integrate uh, agricultural practices as a learning module. Number three, is to pro promote certain training, uh, training programs. And the last two most important things are no to empower women to become income generators, and number two, to make the idea of microfinancing much closer to them in very simpler terms. Let me take you to a certain framework of where I work in. This is the map of Lebanon. All the red dots are the refugee, the refugee camps. The refugee camp that I work in is in, located in the Saida town in southern of Lebanon and it's called Ain al-Hilwe. And as you can see, it's a very, 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 it's a large camp comparatively, and it's in the middle, middle part of the, of the city, around a lot of Lebanese people, Lebanese, Palestinian, there's a lot of social upheaval when it comes to that issue. To give you a certain sense, a certain sense that I also gave you to the location of this room, a normal average family, American family, will have that much space to live in. 
A normal Lebanese family will have that much space to live in. More than five families of refugees, Palestinians, live in that tiny space. So we decided to intervene. We decided to promote, to start an urban agriculture uh, strategy that aims to create green roof water rooftops, which sounds very easy, very easy to handle. We just need the mechanisms. We need the power. We need the people to enter the refugee camp in which most of the time, as Lebanese, you cannot enter the refugee camp. The, the refugee camp is outside any authority, any Lebanese authority. To enter into the refugee camp, you need UN, UN, a US, let's say, US order in order for us to get in. As Lebanese, I cannot get into the refugee camp. If I would like to invite anybody to get into the refugee camp, I won't be allowed to. So we decided to intervene when it comes to mapping the existing area and to see how we can integ integrate green rooftops to it. Very simple. These are, these are more than, like in this area, you can estimate there are 200 people living, just to give you a certain uh, idea of what's going on. The houses you can see on the top are, these are, you know, these are considered fancy houses. They have water tanks. This is very rare to find inside a refugee camp. This is the neighborhood that we've been working. This is the distance in the alleyways that we have to enter sometimes just by sliding in. This is in general how the, the whole area looks like. And this is where agriculture comes in. This is part of vertical agriculture, which can be done on the foreface of, of the house. And then there's horizontal agriculture, which can be done on the rooftop of the house. These are certain samples of what houses look like. It's not easy to intervene anyways when it comes to agriculture because we have to promote certain rainwater harvesting ideas. We have to remove a lot of debris. It's not something that, that, that you can imagine. So this is the UNRWA Vocational Training Center. UNRWA. UNRWA. They should have money. You should prepare a much better vocational training center for the people that are living there. But this is how it looks like. So we decided, this is how it looks like, this, what we decided to do is to turn it into a much greener place where people can go inside and they can ask for help. Where people can go inside and ask, okay, let me see, let me get some training to see how it goes. How, we, how can I put a lot of input, while I'm putting, excuse me, a lot of input to do a change, how my output would reach that level of efficiency. So we started placing a lot of water tanks, we did a lot of stairways to reach to the tops, to the top, and we did more than 20 training sessions to integrate women about, hey, listen to me, you can, you can grow vegetables and fruits, but it won't end there. F each five households, we have conglomerated them, each five households are part of they become part of a supplier of a local restaurant to give that local restaurant some fruits and some vegetables with less than $10, making less than $10 a day. $10 for, if you tell me, like other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, they only make maybe $1, $1 a day. $10 sounds a lot. So what women are doing, they're growing their vegetables, they're growing their fruits, and they're selling them. And they're getting that $10. They're getting that $10 and keeping it to themselves. Do you know why? It was unfortunately the stereotype idea that men are taking it for wep for, to, to, to get weapons is absolutely true. We do not even communicate with men. A man will not even listen to me. He will not even look at me. He will inhibit me from talking to his wife. This has, has happened numerous times when we're like, Monsieur, we're trying, please, can I talk to your wife? I was like, you know, how, how, how is that even possible that you're asking me to get that permission? So it's always with women. Women integrate their children. They remove them. They get the boy. So the boy won't be spending most of his time with his father. So the boy won't be all the time seeing a gun on the, next to the belt of his father. And he, daddy, let me see how, how can I play with this. And now we shoot somebody. And all of a sudden, there's a huge turmoil inside the refugee camp. So when it comes to how we can empower Palestinians, the first thing that we need to do is we need to forget about pitying them. I'm not here to give you a certain idea of how the situation is in the refugee camp. Let's pity them. Let's try to get some crowd funds for them and all of that. It's just about how simple measures, just like agriculture, on your rooftop can empower that woman by, it, by herself to become an income generation, generator for her family. Thank you very much. <laughs>